Good evening and a very, very warm welcome to you. Uh, Retune in to the Capital Hermes Healing Channel with Mr. Noel. Some people say Noel. Uh, if the, the talk gets a little bit tedious and a little bit boring, uh, ask me to move out of the way and you can actually watch TV. I don't recommend it because it's complete mind rot. But there you have it, 24-7 news channel. <laughs> So I'll put my frame back in front of the frame, which is on the wall. This is a talk about two of the, do it the right way, yeah, that way, not the other way. No, don't even go there, Noel. Uh, two of the major concepts of the, uh, of the fourth way teachings, and they are sleep and mechanicalness. And there is an aspect of the fourth way teaching, which the more one goes into it, can be and is uh, rather uh, severe in the way that it attacks uh, one's false personality, which is acquired. So it's like a breaking a, the, the hard crust around the essence to actually get to the essence. And that can't be done without tremendous shocks. Uh, and the purpose of the shock is to actually at least uh, attempt to actually wake us up from this sleep that we are in. And I presume that I give this broadcast, if you want to call it that, or call it whatever you wish, uh, in deep sleep. And I read the other evening the first two chapters of Uspensky's Sublime In Search of the Miraculous, and it's very, very sobering, to say the least. Uh, there's no punches pulled and on top of the sleep which we are in total and utter sleep not as a metaphor but as a fact and I'm sitting here on a bed talking about sleep hello uh, on top of that we have mechanicalness so if you combine sleep with mechanicalness and you have a bit of a a bit of a dilemma to say the least uh, what is mechanical? It's a machine, isn't it? You push it one way, it goes one way. Push it the other, it goes the other. And an external impression comes in and the machine responds mechanically. And on top of this, we have a welter of words, which I seem to be very, very good at producing. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, this talking, talking, talking incessantly. And Mr. Uspensky said, man is a talking machine. I wonder if he was referring to me, possibly, or to you, watching this, a talking machine. And in the reality of being, Jean de Salzman goes on to say, uh, it's, it's beyond the words and the thought that the greater reality lies. Not in the words, you can't, words are like a, a smoke screen in front of the greater reality. And I was talking to a friend tonight down there in North Carolina. Hello, Melissa. Melissa, incidentally, is a Greek word which means honeybee. And we spoke for quite a while together. It was very, very uplifting and informative. And one of the major aspects of our conversation was that the words that one, say, one is saying and the thoughts and the concepts are usually out of sync with the inner feelings inside. And and Gurdjieff used to look right through people and it didn't matter what they said, you could actually see the real workings going on inside of what was really occurring because we can plaster it over with words. Oh, I'm fine, I feel great today, everything's wonderful and inside you're dying. Uh, and we're not meant to live like that as human beings, as evolving human beings, we're meant to actually progress and make an opportunity out of every incident that occurs. But if we say in one thing with the lips and internally we feel in something else, there's going to be an explosion at some point. And Maurice Nicole speaks about this in the commentaries. He says a person can be so pleasant and friendly and lovely and so on. And inside there's just an explosion about to take place because the inner vibration is not conjoined with the outer manifestation 
and that is what we are trying to do people who are doing the fourth way work to bring into harmony what's going on inside with what one is actually manifesting to others in one's external environment it's very very beautiful work uh, and very very deeply rewarding but at times very very painful because as I say we have to strip these layers off that we have of acquired personality which is not us it's something that's just put onto us and we are surrounded by people who are talking all the time like myself and it's okay if we don't identify with it and it just goes and disappears but as soon as we identify with it, we, we, we become trapped within a thought concept and a, a, a mental inner picture, which is maybe not in alignment with what's going on inside us. The theory of conscious harmony, to be harmonized. And I'm, I'm 51 years of age now, and I'm done with putting an act on. And I, I used to be an actor. But I'm not acting anymore, nothing to do with it. I want it to be real. And I've seen people, friends who have channeled, who spoke about uh, ceasing to please people. It's a beginning. Uh, it's, a, it's a very, very good beginning, to say the least, to stop from pleasing people and be real and true. Whatever the consequences, be real and true to yourself. And there's a beautiful quote in uh, in Hamlet by... Hamlet's girlfriend's father, Polonius, and it's often misunderstood. And Polonius says to Hamlet, above all else, to thy own sweet self be true. Above all else. And this is basically saying not to give a rat's ass, to be true to yourself. And the outward manifestation will be real. Whatever it may be, it will be real. Uh, and this helps to go beyond concepts of good and bad. And Gurdjieff spoke in, in Beelzebub's Tales about uh, insulting very close friends, very vehemently. And if it's a real friend, uh, it doesn't have a negative impact because the essence is real. It's just a word, isn't it? People are just using words, but they become identified with the word and they lose their inner essence in that identification with the word. Uh, I'd like to read for you a section of In Search of the Miraculous. It's a conversation between Gurdjieff and Uspensky, and it took place in Moscow in 1915 during the First World War. And it was the sec only the second time that Uspensky actually met with Gurdjieff. And they met in a, a very, very noisy cafe on a main road. And Russell, 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 upside down, upside down, boy, you turn me inside out uh, right here it is someone wants this is just a preface to it and I'm getting a lot of uh, questions on my films videos is the modern terminology I think but I'm not modern at all uh, about why m a lot of more people I should say excuse me more people are not interested and involved in the fourth way work and someone asked Uspensky that at a meeting, and his response was, uh, why is this work not more popular? Because we seek to get rid of things which don't serve us any purpose. Most, most seek for things which don't serve them any purpose. We seek to get rid of those things so we can get to something new. And the last thing, although I verified myself, uh, the last thing one wants to hear is the truth about the situation one is in, about life. And at the moment we have uh, turmoil and tension at the Ukrainian border with the Russian forces. And the, that's a tank outside, do you hear it? Coming to London. Uh, we have turmoil. And we have the American and European force, forces on the other side of Ukraine. And the reason I'm saying this, Uspensky was born in Ukraine. And in 1914, he wrote, people are talking about world peace and making the world a better place. This is a lie. 
the reality is that the, pe the names of the people change, but the situations are exactly the same. People will, they will talk about peace and about fine things, and they will, they, they will end up actually fighting with one another and killing one another. This is a reality since the beginning of time. If we want to live a lie and say it could be different, we, we can do that, obviously, but it's not going to, we're not going to evolve from living in lies. So even if it's painful, we must take the truth on board and work with that because it's the only thing that will give us something. This is the, the conversation. Uspensky. Uh, once I was speaking about London, where I had been staying a short while before the terrifying mechanisation that was being developed in the big European cities, and without which it was probably impossible to live in these immense whirling mechanical toys. People are turning into machines, I said, and turning, and no doubt, Sometimes they become perfect machines, but I do not believe that they can think. If they tried to think, there could not have been such such fine machines. Gurdjieff's response. Yes, it, that is true, but only partly true, as it depends on which mind they use for the work. If they use the proper mind, they will be able to think even better amidst their work with all machines. But then again, if only they think with the proper mind. A man may be a machine whilst working with machines, but there is another mechanization which is far more dangerous, and that is being a machine oneself. Look at all these people you see walking down the, along the street. They are simply machines, nothing more. Uspensky, are there no people that are not machines? Gurdjieff, maybe there are, only not the people that you see, and you do not know them. All the people that you see, all the people that you know, all the people you may get to know are machines actual machines working solely under the power of external influences. As you yourself said, machines that are born and machines they die. Even as we are talking, millions of people are trying to kill one another. Where are the savages? Where are the intellectuals? They are all alike. Uspensky, can one stop? being a machine. Gurdjieff. Ah, that is the question. If you'd asked such questions more, we, we may have got somewhere in our talks. It is possible to stop being a machine, but, but, but first of all, it is necessary to know the machine. A machine does not know itself. When it does, it is no longer a machine. End of the quote from the, the conversation from In Search of the Miraculous. And the motto at the study centre in Fontainebleau was four simple words. To know, to be. It's actually knowing. And a gentleman who started to email, email me uh, was speaking about this the, the other evening. Hello, Graham. Thank you for watching and taking part and, and sharing and so on. And thank you for your lovely emails. He was talking about knowing and the, the vast difference between believing something and thinking something and knowing. It's all the difference in the world into one's inner state, into one's level of being, to know, to be. What do I know? I know that this work is true. I've been involved for 25 years since I was a young man in my mid-twenties. 
and I've been through some extraordinarily difficult times and dealt with some very, very insincere people who have really hurt me. But I know that this is true. And Maurice Nicole, it, it prompts me to a quote, says in the commentaries, uh, how many difficult situations must you go through? How many hardships before you realise that the work is true and you begin to do it? And since starting this channel, I've actually begun to do it. And the rewards are tremendous. But as you know, we are comprised of different eyes. And an eye will get in which wants to jeopardise, or a number of eyes, which want to jeopardise the whole situation. And when you're in that eye, it's very, very difficult to actually to work against it because you have to fight, because they're fighting for their lives. And they want to stay where they are. And to get the permanent eye and the true development, they've got to be destroyed mercilessly. But they keep creeping in, they keep, keep, keep creeping in. And there is a, a term called deputy steward. And it's where one eye takes control of a large group of other eyes, which are, which are against the work, and tries to actually deal with them. That's deputy steward. And permanent eye is in the very, very center of all the different eyes floating around, which are against the work. When I say against the work, against personal development and inner growth, and if we're not developing and we're not growing, we, we as Gurdjieff says, we are just machines. And the, the, the take home that I get from this little talk is that when we know that we are a machine, we cease to be one. So if all our reactions are mechanical, our thoughts, our physical actions, and we realise this, we stop being a machine. Because a machine wouldn't realise, would it, that it was mechanical. And there's a beautiful uh, description, Gurdjieff and Yuspensky used the uh, Gospels on many occasions to clarify their message and to give an example and one of the most perfect ones about being a machine and not being a machine is in, I think it's in the Gospel of Matthew. And Jesus says, if you are walking down the street and someone slaps you in the face, punches you in the face, offer your other cheek. He's actually a divine being. Jesus Christ is asking you to offer the other cheek. Now, fine words. But let's put it into practice. You go out of your apartment, your house, someone from nowhere comes up and punches you right in the face. Will you offer the other cheek? To do so does two things. It, 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 in a nanosecond, when you offer the other cheek, you become conscious. And more importantly, you clear any negative karma which would have been brought about by retaliating, by hitting the person back in the face. But this takes a tremendous awareness of consciousness before one can actually do it. Because we, it stops us reacting and we act. You know, stop acting and start acting. Uh, and this is, a, this is not a mechanical thing, this is a conscious thing. And there's a very, very famous quote in the work. Uh, act a role externally, but never identify internally. So you become objective, not only to yourself, but to the external situation that's taking place. And my last talk was, a, was an exercise about together being observing oneself, the incoming impression and the reaction to it. And this puts one into a state of, it defies description. It is so, so unlike anything one could possibly imagine. It goes far, far beyond words. And not reacting mechanically does the same thing. Which reminds me of a quote of John Pentland, who was a, uh, a friend of Gurdjieff in the last few years of Gurdjieff's life. And John Pentland was an Englishman, and he had the Gurdjieff uh, Study Centre in New York. And he also worked in California. And he was a close friend of Jean DeSaltzman, the reality of being a lady. And he gave lots and lots and lots of talks, and he wrote a few things. The writings are very, very hard to find. But in relation to what I've been saying about conscious response, he has a very, very famous quote, which I've mentioned before. 
in any particular situation, we have a choice. The choice is there. We can either react mechanically to what is coming in, or we, we can connect to higher source, which actually fits in, which corresponds with the exact situation we are in. We can connect to higher source. And this constant re mechanical reaction and so on and so forth, it just takes a moment of, of vivid consciousness. Don't do that. Don't react like that. Connect to divine source, to higher source, and act accordingly. And then the miracles start flowing. And I've let's take it on a, on a bit of a personal note. I've had my work cut out this week. I'm I'm friends with someone, and it's become very very close, very very intimate friendship, a deep friendship, and it's led to a number of arguments and disgruntlements. And I've responded totally, not really mechanically, and actually said things that I shouldn't have said if I'd have been conscious of what I was doing. Uh, and it, I could lose a, a very, very good friend. So it's one thing saying it to become conscious of one's reaction, and it's another thing doing it. But the difference between saying and doing is makes all the difference in the world. That's why it's called work. We're here to work upon ourselves, our reactions, what we believe to be true, our perceptions, to work upon ourselves. And there comes a point when one has to stop reading the stuff and go out and communicate with other people, as I'm doing now, with people I meet and so on. And it's it's second line of work, sharing the work with other people. And the third line is a very, very long, 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 long way away. And that's direct work with influence C, with the divine being itself or beings uh, actually working with them. I believe I have over the last 25 years, actually encountered influence C in the form of, in the form of other human beings on a few occasions. Uh, and it's, it makes all the hardship and the pain that one has been through more than worthwhile. Because this has been, and it cannot be changed, it's now set in, in stone, it can't be changed. Influence C is real, divine powers are very, very real. But unfortunately, man has turned esoteric scripts, such or scriptures, such as the Gospels, into an organised man-made religion, full of rules and what one must do and what one mustn't do. Which, to me, is not truly divine at all. It's the polar opposite. Divinity is freedom, total and utter freedom, and the only law within that divine freedom is do anything you want to do anything but never ever ever hurt anyone or do anything bad to them because it's it, it's accruing the karma which just goes on and on endlessly and we need to clear that and the lady i mentioned tonight melissa we spoke about healing and she mentioned generational healing from one's parents one's grandparents a long long line of it and so on and it can take many many years to actually to truly heal and there's a wonderful passage a very short one in the gospel of matthew again and jesus says to the, the professed healer uh, heal thyself physician so we must heal ourselves from all our wounds and hurts and damage totally 110 percent before we can even attempt to heal anyone else it's, 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 a, it's a mathematical law. As I said when I began this talk, it's no good just talking and talking and feeling something different inside. It needs to harmonise. And then you can actually help people once you've helped yourself. I love doing this work, as you know, and it gives me great, great joy to be able to do it. And I would like to, my next talk, later in the week, I would like to talk about the gentleman who introduced me to the fourth way, to Gurdjie for New Spensky, and his name was Michael Proudfoot, and he, he had been a professional painter. He's from a completely different planet altogether. And until I met him when I was 25, 26, whatever, I'd never heard of Gurdjie for New Spensky. And Michael was part of my life for 
about 20 years through my mid-40s. It's an incredible story. There is something here spiritually and physically which is very, very beautiful, but which is not perceived by the majority of people on this planet. And when one comes to this work, it's through divine influence. You don't find it, it finds you all the time. Like, like I, I had a, a friend a couple of years ago and I met her online, she had a channel and, and I mentioned, I don't know why, but I suggested some things for her to read. And I suggested The Fourth Way by Uspensky. And lo and behold, uh, she said she already had a copy. And it wasn't just a copy, it was a, a hardback, Rutledge and Keegan Paul, exactly the same as the one I had. Many, I don't know where it is now, but it, 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 the one that she had was exactly the same. And the reason I'm talking about her with regards, we are called to the work, we, we don't find it ourselves, it finds us. This lady was in a bookstore in Los Angeles, and for some reason, this book, this fourth way, actually magnetized, magnetized her to it, and she just could not draw herself away from it, and she was compelled to purchase a copy. And she flicked through a few pages, but she never read it and took it to heart. Life took a different course, but the work found her, and one day she may, when she's a bit older, she may go back and have a look at it. Because it is, it's like in, in the Bible, the man who found a pearl of great price and he gave, every, he gave everything he had uh, to possess that pearl. Everything. And one is tested on a daily basis to see if one is worthy to do it. I've had people even phone me and say to me, is your ego involved here? Not at all, at all in any shape or form. I share because I love what I do and I love to share it with other people. No ego involvement at all. Uh, and it's a beauty, it's been a very, very beautiful journey the last six months actually doing this. But I want to keep it real all the way through. And I've just felt over the last few weeks that it becomes more real and more real as time goes by and all the the stuff on the surface is just swept aside. And another friend said to me the other week, I think it was via her, uh, a program on her channel, and she said, naturally, the things that you are not meant to be with just slip away, and the things you are meant to be with actually stay solidly with you. And that was a friend by the name of Emily. I don't know whether she's still my friend, who knows? But you will either slip away or you won't slip away, it will, it will happen naturally. The people who we are meant to be with will be with us and we will develop an inner core of people doing this work and it will continue. I'm very, very pleased. And people have said to me that the phone me and, and WhatsApp me and things and said there's so many groups around which are bogus. Yeah, I've been to a couple of them only for one meeting many, many years ago when I was about 30. And uh, no names mentions, mentioned, but they were as far away from the true teachings of Gurdjieff as could possibly be imagined. They couldn't be further away if they tried. Uh, let's see what's going on here now. For any of you with an artistic bent, the painting here behind me is The Garden Party by August Renoir. I do like my painting. As I say, Michael, who introduced me to the fourth way, was a professional painter. And he, I learned so much from him about art and its integration into life and its uplifting factors and so on. The art of creation, whether it be literature, music, painting, whether it be human souls, to create a soul. And this fourth way is also referred to as the way of the sly person. And there is a reason for this. A, a, a certain degree of slyness is required, probably above all else, because the story goes as follows. It's courtesy of In Search of the Miraculous again. There was a man who actually developed his soul to a very, very high degree, to a very, very large degree. It was just developed tremendously. And when he died, he got to the gates of heaven. 
and St. Peter was standing there. And St. Peter said to him, did you develop your soul in life? Did you remember yourself? And the guy was, was full of pride and excited. And he said, yes, of course I did. Of course I developed my soul. Of course I remembered myself. I did it perfectly. And out of the shadows, the devil appeared and grabbed him and said to St. Peter, this one's mine. <coughs> and away he went from the heavenly kingdom, the way of the sly man, because there are forces in the etheric realm which are actually against human individual development. They're in some type of limbo world and they see, obviously, etherically, what is actually going on and try to prevent it. This is why it's known as the way of the sly man. It's very, very interesting, the whole thing. Not this talk that I'm giving now, giving now but the fourth way. And uh, above all else, to thy own sweet self be true. I will conclude that quote. Above all else, to thy own sweet self be true, and all else will be true to you, as sure as night follows day. You can watch TV now. People skating on the snow. I know someone who goes on the snow. She's always got snow snow shoes on. Down there in Vancouver. You know who you are. I hope you enjoyed this talk. And if you'd like to ask any questions, there's a an email address in the description box. And anyone wishing to contribute in any shape or form, uh, fiscally, financially, only if you're able to, uh, there is a, a PayPal link which helps me tremendously because the work I, I hi, the, hello the work I have at the moment is is I'm struggling financially and it's, it's extremely difficult but I take it as work and I just about get my head above water but anyone wishing to show their appreciation or their support of what I do as I say there's a PayPal link in the description box I don't like doing this but I have to because I can't it, I obviously can't live on fresh air I don't have an income of any kind at the moment uh, but nothing will stop me doing this even if I become emaciated and like a skeleton I will continue to do it as long as there's breath in me have a very very nice day evening and enjoy yourselves and when you're happy the vibration is completely changed and you attract things to you which are also very, very beautiful and happy just by being happy, by being at peace with yourself and by being grateful. It opens doorways into other things. And try, if it's possible, to be with people who think the same as you, who have the same perspective upon life because it actually it, it helps you develop more by being with such people it creates a vibration, which is very, very powerful. Uh, one day I'll give a talk about negative emotions and the, the absolute dangers of them. They're something we're not born with. We acquire them from other people. We're surrounded by them. <laughs> Whether verbalized or not, they're there all the time. And I will finish with, the, with a quote from Uspensky. If we realized what we are losing by the expression of negative emotion, we would be horrified because we lose everything we wish to gain. Very beautiful quote. The whole, as I said in the beginning of this talk, we are machines. And as soon as we become aware and we know that we are machines, we stop being one and we become conscious beings. And a small number of people, maybe less than a hundred, could actually transform things globally on an astronomical level if they are genuinely working and doing this work. As I say, we are tested on a daily basis. And do we, we pass the test or do we fail? Lots and lots of love to you. And I forgot to say, if you've got this far, I don't know, it's gone for about three and a half hours. Uh, the sandwiches over there on the, the sofa and thing, well, not on the sofa, 
on a table and drinks fizzy pop and wine if you need to sort of you know just cool yourself down after this very very long talk all the all of you who have made it this far uh, very very well done uh, and I find we tend to rush things and I've noticed this with people I meet uh, I'm financially struggling but I'm big and strong I will cope with it but I have all the time in the world and that's something you cannot put a price on I was thinking this the other day to have the 20 even if you only got a few dollars in your pocket to have the 24 hours for yourself and I have a like a one bedroom apartment here which is self-contained and it, it could be on top of a mountain somewhere it's very very peaceful and quiet it's like a a study cell for me which is really really beautiful so I think by slowing things down we actually achieve far far more than doing it quickly Noel Zippo I'll see you again very soon and as I say to all the new subscribers thank you very much and lots and lots of love to everyone who's actually watched this and people leave comments and things and if you're going through anything that's seemingly difficult uh, it's good it's very very good because the the comfortable life just sitting on a great big marshmallow somewhere uh, having oven ready roast chickens fly into your mouth is not one that's worth having so how do I turn this off now? Thank you very much. Lots of love.